I was flipping through my Facebook page a couple weeks ago. I'm sitting on the couch. It's a Sunday. I'm watching the Tampa Bay Rays play on television. Various people are running around my house. And I see this photo. And this photo, and here's the text that goes with this photo, um, purports to be a 28-foot alligator that was killed by a game warden just outside of Lakeland, Florida. And I really, really, really want to share this photo. And I really want to share this particular photo with this person. His name is Miles Parks. And he's a friend of mine. Um, he's about to take a job as a reporter in Lakeland, Florida. right? And so I'm really excited for him to take this job because I think that small towns where weird things happen, that's the greatest place to start your job as a journalist. Absolute greatest place. Those of you who started your job in a small, weird town, Raise your hand, right? Don't you agree? Um, I started my, my career in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, a small, weird town where weird things happen. And I wanted, to, I wanted to share with him how excited I was. Because a lot of times when you're starting your job in that small, weird town, you're not as excited as the people who have gone before you that you're starting that job. You're kind of scared. You think you're going to the middle of nowhere. So I really, really wanted to share this with Miles. And the problem is, well, here, let's go back here. The problem is, is that when you're on the iPhone and you're on the Facebook app, there's no share button, right? There's comment and there's like, but there's no share. So I do what most people don't do. I devote extra energy to this. I get my laptop out. I open my laptop up. I find the same content. I hit the share button there, and I start to type in Miles' name, and it doesn't show up. Now, the reason that Miles' name didn't show up is because Miles had recently deleted his Facebook page, which is a whole topic of a whole other TED Talk, right? It's this fascinating phenomenon where lots and lots of people are doing this. But I couldn't find his Facebook page. Um, so instead, I got frustrated. I'd spent enough time trying to figure out how to share this with Miles and just decided to share it with everybody that I know. So I posted it to my own Facebook page, where I have 1,095 friends. So within minutes, within minutes, my friends start responding to this. And you can see the very second response is a link to Snopes.com, right? And I'm like, oh, crap. So in addition to that, right, right? This, is, this is the Snopes breakdown of this. And it comes up in April 2013. It also came up in April of 2006. In August of 2005, the same photo. I am so stupid. Why did I share this? I don't know, but I'm not the only one. Because since I shared it, two of my friends, as a result of my sharing it, then shared it with other people. right? So now I feel really horrible. And I'm wondering, how the hell did this happen to me? Right? Because I, this is, those of you who know what I do, I spend time figuring out how other people screw this up. Right? This is my job. And then I go to newsrooms and I teach them how to not do this. Right? So, so I'm mortified. I'm embarrassed. And I'm really struggling to figure out why we get things wrong. And this is after spending a good portion of my, my career here at Pointer trying to answer this question. So the thing is, there's, um, there's this author. Her name's Catherine Schultz. She actually has done a TED Talk. I recommend that you look it up. Um, she wrote a book called Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margins of Error. Um, and Scholl says this. She says that it is not in our human nature to imagine that we are wrong. Right? So think about this. One of the reasons that being wrong happens is because being wrong feels just like being right. <laughs> now, now, you may be thinking, well, you certainly didn't feel like you were, you, you, you didn't feel the same way. You're humiliated, you're embarrassed. But that's different. That's not being wrong. That's realizing that you're being wrong. And there's a difference, right? There's a huge difference. When you realize you're wrong, then you experience all those negative feelings that maybe will prevent you from being wrong in the future. But for the most part, when we are wrong about something, Schultz says, it feels like being right. There are no internal clues. And on top of that, we are socialized. We are socialized from a very early age to believe that being wrong is equated with being lazy and dumb. 
right? So, so it, it is not in our human nature. Schull says that trusting too much in the feeling of being right can be very, very dangerous. And she talks about surgeons who operate on the wrong body parts and people in the military who shoot the wrong person. I mean, there can be some serious consequences. So I don't feel so bad, actually, because I just duped my friends into sharing a hoax about a 28-foot alligator. So I take comfort in the fact that a lot of other people fell for this. Right? So there's this morning show in San Diego, Nolan and Kim. They spent a lot of time on this. They had like, this is only one screen grab, but they had three full screen grabs of information on this and they talked about it on the air. Um, in Bay City, Michigan, they posted it too. And so obviously people in Michigan and San Diego don't know anything about alligators. <laughs> But I live in Florida, right? I should know something about alligators. So I'm, I kept going back and thinking, what were the warning flags? What should I have been looking at? And this is what we do. This is what we do to try and fill that gap that we know exists, right? Because I know this gap exists. The moment that I am actually wrong and the moment that I feel wrong, that I realize that I'm wrong, I've got to bring those two points in time together. So I'm trying to figure out how you do that. And one of the ways is you look at warning flags. So what are the warning flags in this particular post that I made? One of them is the source of the information. So the source of the information is South Fork Anglers. South Fork Anglers is in Idaho Falls, Idaho. And they're, they're, they have a great website. And they mostly post pictures that look like this. Or like this, sometimes like this. They, I, they have a remarkable number of really cute women who fish. Um, which, uh, check it out, I'm telling you, it's really interesting. Sometimes they post photos like this, and this maybe could have been a warning photo, right? Like I'm not sure this photo is, is true too, but you would expect South Fork anglers in Idaho Falls, Idaho to do more about grizzly bears than they do about alligators. So that's, that was one warning flag. The second warning flag is the lack of a familiar media, right? Like, so I live here in Florida. I work at the Pointer Institute. We are associated with the Tampa Bay Times. You would think that if they found a 28-foot alligator anywhere, that, that South Fork anglers would not have been my only source <laughs> of information, right? Like maybe the Tampa Bay Times. But when you search the Tampa Bay Times for 28-foot alligator, you don't get anything that looks like that story. Or maybe the Lakeland Ledger. Like maybe this was a really new story. But you'd think that the ledger would have been on top of it. But this is the only story that you come up with when you search the Lakeland Ledger for 28-foot alligator. So obviously, those reliable media sources were not onto it. Should have been a warning sign for me. So another warning sign, 60,000 shares, 60,000 shares at the bottom of that. And I'm seeing it for the first time. Huge, huge warning sign. OK, and then finally, finally, this warning sign here, common sense, right? I thought about this. I thought, I'm sitting in my living room. I live in a really small house. And it's probably 28 feet from one corner of my living room to the other corner of my living room. And, and here's what I thought. That's a big ass alligator. <laughs> you know? I didn't think, I've lived in Florida for 11 years, I didn't think, wow, I've never heard of an alligator more than 13 or 14 feet being caught, and this is twice that size. I didn't think that at all. Um, and then I also could have read the comments, right? Another warning sign. I could have read the comments, and I would have easily deduced that this was fake. So how did I ignore these warning signs and post this photo? Part of it is that I was, I was acting on an emotion, not necessarily rationality. I wanted that positive reinforcement that you get when you create an experience for other people. Right? That's what social media is all about, and I really wanted that. Um, the other thing is, is I'm sitting at home, so I don't necessarily have my thinking cap on, as we tell small children to put their thinking caps on. Um, I don't know why. It's not like I don't ever work from home, but at that point, you know, it's, maybe it's because the Rays were playing. I don't know. But I, I was not thinking about common sense. And the thing is, is that this is a pattern. This is not just my alligator that's the problem. There is a lot of other bad information out there that just won't die. We 
experience patterns of repeating bad or unsubstantiated information over and over again in our current media ecosystem. You can think about Barack Obama's birth certificate, or you can think about the connection between vaccines and autism as classic examples, but those are kind of old. Those happened a while ago. This happens all the time. Bill Adair is in the room, and he reminded me of this particular case from last year. So there was an ad that ran from a uh, political action committee called American Crossroads, and they made a claim in this ad that 85% of college students, college graduates, are moving back in with their parents. So PolitiFact checked this out. Here's my sourcing, my fair use. Um, PolitiFact checked it out and ultimately determined that this study is totally a piece of crap. That's not what they, that wasn't their ruling. Their ruling was false. My interpretation is a piece of crap. Among the things that they discovered, um, the organization responsible for this called 20somethinginc.com, um, 20 um, 20 um, a research consulting group. Their phone number was disconnected. All of the pictures of their board members were actually stock photos, right? So this was a fabricated, <laughs> organization to create a fabricated study to perpetuate this information, and yet, and they also compared it to, to some real research, right? So, so Pew, um, Pew's research talked about 42% of 18 to 29 year olds, college grads have said that they've moved back in with their parents, 41% of 25 to 29 year olds, 29% of all parents. None of those numbers come close to the 85% claimed in this study, and yet, Time Magazine, uh -huh. CNN, the Huffington Post, actually twice the Huffington Post reported it. Over and over again, you can find this information reported over and over again, and you can find it passed along in social media, you can find it reported by very credible sources, and by lots and lots of people who, who feel like it must be true because their kids are living with them, or their neighbor's kids are living with them. So I'm not making an excuse for this. This is journalistic malfeasance. It's most likely brought on by a slippage of standards due to an incredible demand to publish. But the other thing that I'm thinking about is I am at the end of a year-long process where I am creating not just a framework for digital journalism ethics, but a new framework for ethical thinking in journalism. Because I feel like we need that. I feel like our old articulation of our standards doesn't work as well as it used to before this, this new world, this new world descended on us. And part of, part of, part of the, my realization in this process is that news doesn't belong to journalists. News and information belongs to the public. And, and as we study the evolution of news, you know, we go back to the Agora, which is the ancient Greek marketplace where people exchanged ideas in a democracy. Or we look at the, the ports in, in Europe during the age of exploration where people were getting off of the ships and sharing stories about what they saw. And, and eventually people were paid to report those stories and to report the manifests of the cargo and passengers on those ships. And then eventually we get to this point in journalism where we start creating styles and routines. There is a professionalization, and the professionalization is in part an attempt to bridge that gap. That gap between when we get something wrong and when we realize it's wrong. And that's why we create these standards. You know, back when, I was, back when I was that cub reporter in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, a re, a, an editor taught me how to fact check a story, right? And you print the story out, you highlight every fact, and then you review your evidence for asserting that fact. And you ask yourself, is it possible that this is really true? And that was a professional attempt to, to bridge that gap between when, when we got something wrong and when we realized it was wrong. And our attempt in journalism to do that was to do it to figure out, make that realization before the information went public. But the thing is, is now we're not there. Now we're here. 
And my alligator sits right next to some of the most important news of the day. We live in a user-controlled media world, and we have to hone our senses. And so I'm trying to figure out what this process has taught me about my alligator. And it's taught me this. It's taught me that we all develop stopgap measures, and that sometimes our stopgap measures are defensive. We come at them with a defensive posture. But sometimes we come at them with, with, an, with a posture of humility. And that when we come at it with a posture of humility, that's actually a much better approach for, for, for bridging that gap between the moment we get something wrong and the moment we realize it's wrong. This is a, um, this is a quote that Tom Rosenstiel, my, my co-editor, actually inserted into our new guide, our new principles for journalism. And here's the plug for the book. It's called The New Ethics of Journalism, Principles for the 21st Century. It will be released on August 1st. And Tom actually wrote this as, as a bullet point under one of the principles. And he says, make intellectual honesty your guide. And humility, rather than false omniscience, your asset. And so I keep coming back to this concept of humility and what that means. And one of the things that humility means is that we recognize the possibility that we might be wrong at any given moment. And that's something that we have to realize is counter to our evolutionary development, but critical to making democracy function in this, this crazy age that we're living in. So, I think humility is the answer. Thank you very much.